namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa buddhang dhammang sangang namasami <coughs> There are <coughs> um, two views, particular views one can note um, that uh, act as a kind of foundation, can act as a foundation for uh, practice, Dhamma practice, you know, that we you know, can kind of can return to. One is the, pra- the sense of, well, you know, you're on your own. And it's important to really cultivate your own wisdom, um, be true to yourself, and uh, be a refuge to yourself. And realize, you know, the world is the way it is, and you have to don't get caught up in it and keep going. Mm. And this occurs when we feel a sense of conflict or disappointment or dissonance with the situation we're in. Mm. and it has a certain validity to it it's to do with intentionality isn't it what you're going to do another view is we're all in this together there's really no fundamental separation Um, you know what's uh, we need to share and be caring for each other and practice in that way a sense of open-heartedness towards other people and ourselves. This view also arises when we feel a sense of conflict, disappointment, um, frustration, loneliness. You know? So both these, and it has a certain validity to it. <clears throat> both these views uh, can be discerned in the Buddha's teaching. You know, be a refuge to yourself, a fair onwards, lonely as rhinoceros horn. <laughs> uh, and also, uh, one should cultivate a mind that's aimed for my welfare, the welfare of others, and for Nibbana. Cultivate the cultivations of loving kindness, compassion, uh, appreciative joy, gladness at other people's welfare and equanimity relationship to others so both these views have a validity and uh, both stem from the same fundamental experience of a sense of dissonance mm-hmm. so it's important to uh, recognize what what their validity is and what the ceasing of these views is how valid they are and when they, these views are transcended, so we don't really talk about ourselves, because how can you talk about such a thing? <laughs> you know. So if you take the sense of practice to yourself, be a refuge to yourself, and you take that as a fundamental reality rather than as a particular angle, then you end up with a tremendous sense of stubbornness and indifference to other beings. Um, and... Uh, uh, sort of isolation, where you, you discount uh, your actions in the world become irrelevant. Um, the actions of other people become less relevant because it's just that's the way it is. You have to fare on on your own. Uh, so this particular view then heightens a sense of an isolated self, even how that self may be, uh, you know stacked with all kinds of good ideas and skills and virtues it still doesn't uh, and lead into the dissolution of self-view the other view you know we're all connected we're all part of each other also doesn't lead to the dissolution of self-view because it just adds to a sense of a a manifold selves Mm -hmm. other beings we can be worrying about uh, feeling separated from 
wanting to connect to and so on and so you get the that also leads can lead to a sense of losing one sense of uh, um, perseverance and and uh, uh, author- authenticity. If we kind of dissolve into something that's really a, a kind of communal self. <laughs> yeah. So this this view, although it has its uses for uh, relaxing some of our um, stubbornness and edginess and uh, opinionatedness also tends towards uh doesn't lead to nibbana by it on itself by its own on its own so sometimes people talk about interdependence or or sometimes they talk about independence independence be independent doesn't really make sense um what are you independent of you've got no body where did your body come from where do the teachings come from yeah. Where does breath come from? Where does life force come from? Where does the Dhamma come from? It's not, you know, it's, it's there, isn't it? It's something that we inherit or take on or are fed by or nourished by. So independent doesn't really make sense as a fundamental position. Interdependent is a nice uh, view. Uh, we can say it's an ecological view and it's a social view how to get on with others, how to recognize we uh, have to coexist. That also is, is a certain ability to do it, but you can recognize also that it doesn't really finally um, pertain because I don't mind being interdependent with, uh, with butterflies and flowers, but I don't really want to be interdependent with crocodiles and poisonous snakes, thank you. I'd like to remain completely independent of those. <laughs> You know, so it's uh, these, uh, and what's more, um, more pertinent to the Buddha teaching is neither independence nor interdependence, but codependent arising, which is the uh, understanding of dependent or codependent arising is what um, the Buddha pointed to as how the here and now is experienced um, manifestations, uh, and so. Dependent because there are sense bases, then sights and sounds arise. But if there were no forms to see, there would be no sights and sounds. So, the arising of experience of sights and sounds depends upon consciousness, but also depends upon some form or another. You can't have, you know, a sight visual consciousness without something to see. So the the seeing, but similarly there could be things to see. But if your eyes are closed, it doesn't happen. So. The co-arising of experience is is inter is codependent. Yeah, you know, it's not interdependent; it's codependent. Um, so this gives us a, and with that codependence, you can't really say you're you're separate from, or can you say you're the same as? Because you know, there's just the arising of this. The arising of sights, sounds, the arising of thoughts and perceptions. And you can't really carve a separate self out from that, or you can't really carve other people out from that. What's happening is interdependent arising, codependent arising, and that's the understanding of the Buddha. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> often what we're cultivating in practice is you know we look into we take our standards we take our our uh, guidelines from the present moment the inter the codependent arising in the present moment what else can you really consciously uh, verify apart from what's happening now so this is the the entry to the Dhamma. Yeah. And you recognize in the here and now there are thoughts, there can be thoughts arising, sounds arising, sensations arising, perceptions arising. Mm. Yeah. And who do they belong to? And who is separate from them? As they arise, this is we could say this is the field of being. Or becoming which things are manifesting 
in that field of becoming as it begins to achieve a kind of potency it starts to come welling up you know before we've acted upon it there's the sense of stirrings uh inclinations um you know qualities of feeling and so forth arising isn't that so mm. and the something starts scanning around for what what bit to engage with maybe it doesn't scan around for very long maybe it's already immediately engaging with a memory or a hope or an interest or a problem mm. but if we begin to calm the calm the whole process stabilize it into the present keep stabilizing into the present so we're not following that engagement then we begin to notice there is perceptions impressions arising feelings arising um, qualities of pleasure pain um, warmth bodily things that give us the impression of having a body such as warmth or solidity or sensations and all that in this field of becoming the arising and uh, there's that sense of something scanning or maybe already hooking on to what to engage with as you like there's a decisive this decisive moment so this arising dependent arising is a perceptions is generated through what are called sankara the sankara is a kind of creative formations and uh, they're not independent things they are if you like the primary energy the motor which throws up and forms perceptions you know, in the chitta sankara it's called the perceptions that arise in the mind how do they why, why do we call them arising they're dynamic aren't they suddenly the arising of perception of mother of tomorrow of yesterday it's not a solid thing is it, it just comes welling up now that force that causes it to well up that pushes it up that gravitates towards it that's called sankara uh, and you know a bit of so what <laughs> but the point is that that creative formation is the rising of uh, is the thing that causes a rising and consciousness starts to hook onto something within that so that the the uh, the litany that we remember is uh, dependent upon this sankara is the arising of consciousness that is specific conscious activation conscious focus conscious consciousness or anchoring onto something is dependent upon something welling up for consciousness to to form around mm. yeah so and then what's even more significant in fact is the primary significance is what is the quality of that welling up is it welling up with hunger need uh, uh, worry uh, restlessness uh, something bothering me something i'd like to have something kind of feeling of lack or need something to fill up the space something to push away something to, to what's the what's the quality of that What's the, what's the tone of that welling up? Mm. As that welling up and the tonality of it then becomes the primary factor for engagement. And then karma starts. That is, as soon as that welling up takes something we can get, oh, irritated by, um, oh, needing, oh, opinion. So there's the there's a kind of out of this welling up comes the decisive engagement called intention which means the, that something hooks onto a particular train of thought let's go on that one something hooks onto a particular aim or ambition let's go on that one something hooks onto a particular regret let's go on that one something hooks onto another person let's go on that one something hooks up onto about a sense of myself travels down that one we get on a train and the train chugs chuffs out the station quite merrily and before we know where we are we're traveling through the countryside of our karma this is karma is the intention that first of all 
has that decisive engagement in the field of perception. Hmm? And then then business starts. <laughs> yeah. And it can be good and mottled and bad. And there's also the engagements that lead to the end of that process that derail the train. Yeah. And that derailing is not considered to be negative or barren, but actually an awakening to a tremendous open potential which is not hooked up. It's called freedom. It's not hooked up to, it's not driven. It's not pressed. It's not pushed down. It's not reaching up. It's not floundering round. Yeah. This is, of course, uh, you know, uh, difficult or seemingly mysterious or perhaps esoteric. Yeah, but this is essentially what the Buddha was pointing to in terms of dependent ar- arising and dependent ceasing. Mm. So the dependent arising is on sankara, and the dependent ceasing is the through the quelling, the s- subsiding of sankara, mm. the relinquishment of becoming. So this both requires uh, a tremendous uh, uh, clarity or clarification of view and a steadying of energy. And these are the two hinges of practice, a steadying, calming, balancing, mollifying, and enjoyment of a particular quality of Steady energy is called samatha, steady and calming, and a particular quality of of view and attitude and angling is called vipassana, insight or wisdom, just process of wisdom. And without these two, there is no furthering. And then the the senses, the Buddha is saying, well, you want to develop both of these and understand how you need to develop both. Because they are also codependent, <laughs> you know, and and of course, one of the main problems is all this stuff. The mind so wishes to separate things into myself and you, uh, now and the future, uh, this one or that one, and this is the kind of view that the Buddha and the Dhamma does not support. So in mundane terms, we begin to recognize when we're stirred up, the mind is stirred up, can you sense that? And to even sense the mind being stirred up, you have to have some experience of it not being stirred or less stirred, so you can feel that sense of Ooh, getting bristling up or feeling needy. You know? uh, and this is uh, um, this, this kind of primary um, force of... Um, Tanha. So it's a negative force. The negative force can be seen as both, uh, could be experienced both as direct negativity, that is, I feel ill will or hostility or disgruntled or regret about myself or about others, and the sense of the, the negativity generates or attracts itself towards some perception. So that kind of sense of what's negative negativity like an unresolved negativity is kind of hovering and we find ourselves noticing the things that are wrong in ourselves and in others very common for human beings the things that are wrong so is anything to say anything to bring up oh, i've got a problem to bring up i've got something i've seen that's wrong that needs to be fixed this is very common, in it? certainly in our community. Generally, when somebody says, "Oh, something to bring to the sangha," it's generally not going to be a bunch of flowers. It's going to be there's a problem. There's something that needs to be corrected. There's something I'm not certain about. There's something that needs to be changed into a better state. This may not be ill will, 
but it, it's a, like a rec uh, the way that we are tuned to and uh, sense and are most pricked by and disturbed by things we find ourselves in dissonance with. You don't find people saying, come to a meeting, say, bring something up and somebody says, well, oh, I'm feeling really contented. And so, well, yeah, okay, it's nothing to talk about. It's generally, oh, you know, somebody forgot to take the pig buckets out or these aren't necessarily angry. They're just recognition that we see and we comment on and we see as significant that which is lacking that which is not quite right. That's what we want to talk about. Because when you say everything's fine, you know, nothing to talk about. <laughs> What's the point of that? Yeah. <laughs> so that negativity can be expressed in terms of seeing things that are not quite right or seeing things that we'd like to have happen. So this is absent. So one, there's the direct feeling of pushing away from or being disgruntled with or something that's happening or feeling there's not enough of. So you get both the resistance and the, and the sense of craving. This is the force of tanha. It's a negativity. And the, you know that we can conceive of something better that we could have or could be. And those perceptions and ideas and so forth that come up in that thing, we, we're activated towards that. So it's in this welling up, we sense the potential, or it could be happier, could be more fulfilled, could be longer in this. It's a pleasant state, it'd be nice if it was a bit longer, you know, and, and oh, it's oh dear, somebody's bothered me. You know, or it'd be nice to get further. My meditation hasn't got any further than it should do. I wish it would be a bit better than it is. And the perceptions that support that experience will crystallize. We have a wish-fulfilling mind. Unfortunately, what we're wishing for is generally coming from a negative place. Yeah. This is the easy one. It doesn't take me long, my mind long, to see something that could be improved. Something, it could be just that I wish the woodworm hadn't eaten the pillars here. It could be that you know, this is on kind of deep anger or, or bitterness, just something, the mind's scanning and, oh, look at the stain there. Oh, you know, the non-stain isn't seen, the stain is seen. The bits are all right. Now you look down the wall, and along this wall is a crack around the plaster. Most of that plaster is just there and now crack. I see that crack, oh, crack on the plaster. There's like... How many meters of non-crack? And the crack is maybe one millimeter. <laughs> and there's so many meters of non-crack. The bit of sticks, oh, there's the crack. <laughs> it stands out, doesn't it? Think, oh, that's a shame. Wish you could have sort of smoothed that crack over. <laughs> but if you smoothed it over, you'd see the smoothing marks. You know, just get those smoothing marks out. Now, this is not ill will. This is just a recognition of the one of the functions of mind is to see that which could be improved, changed, better. Then you can activate it. You can't really get a lot of activity around contentment. <laughs> so in Sankara, it also a, has a certain hunger to get something to get activated around. And Sankara is the activation principle and with there is a, it also generates a kind of hunger for action yeah. an action in a very broad sense i mean the action of imagination the action of uh, imagining the future the action of you know getting better meditation and so forth it it, it seeks something to 
change to make into something else. This is the sankhara of becoming and the sankhara of sense, uh, sense inclination and the sankhara of wishing to, to annihilate or um, push things away or not become anything. Yeah. So you begin to notice that, that welling up energy. And as long as we hold it in the present, and you can recognize the way that the train starts and the jumping on board the train. Hmm? Do you have to get on that train? And maybe at first it's really not my choice. Because the mind just jumps onto a thought or a memory about oneself or about others or about this or that or the other. Or it, it jumps onto a mood and it's, it's out. There's no, you know, we may not speak upon it, we may not physically act upon it, and yet the mind has engaged, the, the karma has started. So karma is not just physical action or even verbal action, but it's also this, the most important action the Buddha pointed to is the action in the heart of that decisive engagement with a perception. Yeah. Then, then even though you're not saying anything, you're doing anything, still the mind is creating a world in that. Yeah. of the future, the past, self and other, basically. And all of those positions, you contemplate them. They're all suffering. They're all unresolved. They may not be anguished, they're unresolved, they're not complete yet. The future could be maybe, what will I, how can I, what will I do next year, how will it be, it's unresolved. The past, how was I, what was I, What's that, you know? It's the, it's a kind of an echo chamber. You know? Self, what will I want? What will I be? What do people think of me? How am I? It's suffering. Other people, what's she like? What is she doing? Why does she always do that? He's never like this. Why is he like that? How am I with her? Suffering. When you say suffering, dukkha, it's this sense of a, a kind of uh, an un unresolved uh, quality, churning, moving over. Mm. Mm. So that's a decisive engagement. And this is this is where karma starts, and then the it leads to results. And then one of the results, the most immediate result, is that particular worldview is firmed up. As we maybe as we sit and meditate, a particular set of concerns arise, and that that world view, that aim, that ambition, that sense of oneself or others becomes firmer. It's firmed up by the continual running on of that process, and it's it's very evident. Certainly, when you do retreats, and uh, you know, uh, in the retreat, somebody comes up with some really strong thing they realize they've really got to do. They've got to get out of here, is generally one view. <laughs> because this and that and this and that and he's this and I'm that and it's never going to be this way and it's always going to be that way and you can't, boom. You know, so you spend like, sometimes a few weeks actually assembling that view in detail. Um, and it's, you know, I do this. Um, I have done this, I do it less. Uh, and I, I, I get off the train quicker. But it's, 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 wow, you know, the power of it, the luminosity of some of those images and impressions and convictions and views. It's, wow, you know. And then, then when you're noticing, you know, it gets an obsession. I think I've had retreats, and one retreat I was obsessed with making the perfect bag. I think I've told you this story before. I just, you know, we have these little monk's bags, and you put things in, and they're really quite unsatisfactory. I feel mine, mine is, because it's either got too many pockets, so where did I put that thing? Is it that pocket, that pocket? Or it's got a kind of jumble of stuff all thrown in the middle of it. So I thought, 
must be a way of designing the really the right bag where you have everything exactly where you needed it. So I kind of thought, this bag. How do you how do you make a bag? I spent you know, two weeks with this kind of impression coming up every now and then, and how I was going to get the cloth and with the zips or Velcro and down the dust details of it, uh, the kind of bag that I really needed. And I was, as soon as this retreat finished, I was going to get down to that machine and start knocking this, sewing this bag up. I got to the end of the retreat. Right. I realized I've already got a bag. It's okay. I just learned to be a bit more tidy with it instead. The whole, you know, but <laughs> it just collapsed. <laughs> The impression collapsed. It was astonishing how vivid it was. Uh, I could kind of visualize the stitch length. And also, I realized I'm actually a hopeless sewer, which makes it even more poignant. <laughs> so this is, this is karma. Because even though maybe we don't physically act upon it, during that time, our worldview is being obsessed by that those particular set of images. And this one is a relatively trivial one. What happens when we get a sense of, you know, uh, other people that we feel distasteful or difficulty with, and that wells up, and we see nothing but that, or that particular impression stirs and builds and changes, or something about ourselves we find is regretful or shameworthy or inadequate and that particular perception is engaged with and builds up and stabilizes and uh, you know you, you all these things one certainly hears in retreats people in the retreat saying oh I'm terrible I'm a hopeless case and I'm useless I'm disgusting shameful you know? well actually you know you keep the precepts keep the eight precepts and you meditate what's what's wrong so, well I've got all these terrible thoughts and impressions and feelings you know? Well, um, you know, the the negative mind or the negative sankara seeks those, builds them up, solidifies them. Yeah. And, you know, it's partly how you begin to understand this is through the passion and the drive and the solidity of something that isn't actually here. How can something, you know, particularly when you're sitting in meditation, how can something that is just purely mind-made, made through activity, made through inner churnings, flavoured with dissonance or regret, how can that actually be an external reality? <laughs> you know? If it was completely external, if it was something external, it wouldn't be affecting, would it? But because the effectiveness, the mind being moved and stirred, indicates that this is internal. Otherwise, we wouldn't be feeling it and be stirred up by it and be excited by it and be trying to push it away. Hmm? But if it was completely internal, then there wouldn't be images of people and things and bags and to, to pin it on. So it's codependent arising. That is, you know, there's a whole realm of possible perceptions that occur. We could be imagining butterflies, the destiny of the cane toad, the history of the Crimean War, person who lives next door, what my dog's name is, any of these, the mind is vast and measureless. Something seeks a particular one in that almost measureless domain and gravitates towards that. And yeah, it's there. You can't say it's not there externally. But why does the mind select that one? Why does it firm up that one? Why does it get energized and activated by that one? Yeah. 
it's it's both external but what makes it deeply internal is this uh, force of avijja tanha or ignorance and craving mm. the mind that wants to desperately wants something wants security wants something to not be there wants 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 finds fault with finds difficulty with wants doesn't want wants doesn't want wants doesn't want and then it selects something generates something in this field of potentials to get going on we build our trains and jump on board mm -hmm. And those drives happen more or less unbidden. And that's another feature of it. I don't think that anybody would deliberately think, what can I do that's going to, what can I bring to mind that's going to annoy me? Let me think. Something I can find fault with. Something to regret. That's a good idea. And I think of something I can regret and feel disturbed by. What about having some anxiety now? That would be a good idea, wouldn't it? How about something to get depressed around? So none of this is chosen by some, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a pathology of an instinct. So this is a Ouija tanha or, or ignorance or unknowing or a out of touch or not being in harmony with and then the craving that pulls something into that. You know? And it's, it's, it's not your fault. There's nothing wrong with you. Uh, this is what happens. Something to desire. Something to feel unfulfilled by. Something to feel we should be or should have. Something we feel disappointed in other people about. Something worrying in the future about. Regretting in the past about. How do these things arise? They codependently arise upon... Yes, there are people, forms, sights, sounds, something selects particular objects, firms them up, crystallizes them, and act, gets activated on it. And for the average person, that's, that's pretty out of control. That's something they don't have a lot of say over, except through deliberately planting the mind onto something else that will... will will, um, you know, give it something to hook onto. So an average person basically reads, thinks, watches something, switches something on, talks about something, so that there's some, they are choosing a particular channel of impressions that will give rise to a favourable or stable mood. Without that, you know, the mind is going to swing round back to avijja tanha, this is why one of the most difficult things for people to do is to, to sit quietly on there. <laughs> you know, the average person is going to be, have to be feeding on something because without that, the mind starts to get kind of edgy and restless and saddened and worried because this force of Ouija Tanha just comes up and selects sights, sounds, memories, thoughts, near, far, inner, external to hook onto and then these trains rush out to distress, sorrow, lamentation, grief and despair. Oof. Now the point of view of the codependent arising is not self there's something wrong with me, I should be another way. Nor is it other, it's everybody else's fault. The world is a messy place. What can you have a hope out of it? People are disastrous. Da, 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 da. Neither of those views are going to take one out of suffering. Both of those views have you can you can form, they have some validity to them, but neither of them take you out of suffering. That's the important thing. We're not looking so much for some kind of true statement as as release as release from suffering and when there's release from suffering 
there's no statement that can be made apart from it's released so whenever the mind forms these formations so sankharas become formations they become trains they become tendencies they take form one should know them as this is a formation this is dynamic this is activated where is it going to yeah and if the more solid the formation is the more one should regard it with dispassion wariness <laughs> and diligence no. the more solid it is the more one should one is advised as a view to regard that with concert with hey don't hook on to this just it's dangerously solid it's dangerously convincing yeah this opinion is dangerously convincing but something as likes convincing likes formation likes solidity likes conviction likes decisiveness it makes us feel solid clear we know where we're going and so that that's the hook of sankara that's how karma gets created it tantalizes us with certain definitions perspectives rights wrongs i am this you are that mm -hmm. and then the views begin and there's no way out of suffering in that way seeing this yeah just experiencing it over time <clears throat> Experiencing that process over time. Seeing that, experiencing the stress, the imperfections, the negativities, the inadequacies, the sense of incompletion that occurs dependent upon some of these formations, then one becomes more dispassionate, more cautious, more diligent about conviction, about opinions, about standpoints, about views, about karma. And there's beginning the view, we get a view that begins to remind us and that view is a very powerful guide it keeps reminding us the more solid it is the more you should be careful with it the more convincing it is the more you should be careful of it because if it's convincing and solid it must be formed right how can something you know if it's formed it must have come into being it must have been formed it's got a form and a solidity it must have come into being how did it come into being do you know that if it's come into being it's going to go somewhere and it's going to break up right that's a formation so can we just kind of almost remember that orient around that it's not a matter of is it a pretty formation or a happy formation one should regard all of them as be careful the buddha's final words are all sankharas all sankharas are impermanent changeable be diligent be wakeful that was the last thing he said fare on with wakefulness wake up to this be careful with it this is for your welfare and he's not saying you idiots you shouldn't have them or you are something other than those or you are them or he just says be, be wake up to them be careful you know be diligent about them because if it's formed it must have had an origin yeah and then just bear that in mind because the movement of the formation the plan the vision the opinion yeah the good opinion, the determinations, the, the movement of that 
is, is always pushing the mind along. In the movement of the mind, there is no resolution. The movement of the mind can only go on to the, the train can only keep rolling. And we're reminded again of the Buddha's, uh, you could say his fundamental realization, realization, there is the unformed, the unconditioned, the unbecome, the unoriginated. This is the ending of stress. Now, you know, we, we may not know what that is, but we may use that as a way to contemplate that which is formed as this is something to be diligent about. And you say, what's, what's the quality of this formation? Hmm? Is it generating a sense of self as this or that? And is that flavoured with, you know, conceit, pride, fear, antipathy? You know, weed out the flavourings of that. This formation that forms somebody else, is that flavoured with regret, longing, aversion, comparisons, intimidation? Weed that one out, pull it out. You pick that particular quality out. You know, as you begin to, then you start to dis dissemble these formations, start to, you know, tease out. And, you know, then we, oh, this is regret. When, when something like regret or craving is distilled from the formation, you know, the, the movement, it has no base, it starts to fall apart. So, say, I'm, you know, I'm feeling averse to this particular person because you know, he never turns up on time, something like that. Film, this particular person never turns up on time, and he should turn up on time, and after all, da 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 da. That's a pretty solid piece, it makes sense, it's justifiable, surely this is true. And yeah, yeah, you could say that's true, um, it's got a truth in it, and yet, what am I not noticing? And what is the quality of that form? And I think, you know, I contemplate that, this person, lazy, shiftless, irresponsible, not prude, not careful, doesn't give a damn about anybody else. All this stuff starts to form around this. Why do I have to live with these kind of useless, incompetent, irresponsible people? <laughs> you can really get some energy around that one. Uh, and then, you know, and, wow, create this monster in my mind. And then we say, well, look at this. Now, if you just go to the sense of irritation as something happening you know, in, in the mind, and take the person, the images out of the picture, you know, there's a possibility to that, that irritation just doesn't have anything to, to feed on. So it starts to deconstruct. When one's no longer irritated, you know, exasperated, no longer building something up, then of course it's quite possible to say, oh, Joseph, you know, I thought our agreement was we'd be here at seven. What happened? Um, you know, I'm a bit, feel a bit confused because didn't we say we were going to be here at seven? Mm -hmm. You know, you're not... You can then enter the world of relative forms, free of, of this pressure, this inner drives of, of um, you know, dependent arising of suffering. So, contemplating, understanding, coming into that sense of, um, you know, handling sankharas, dissolving them, doesn't mean we can't act. But it means that driven quality, the compulsive quality, the, uh, and the polluted quality of our actions, that quality, that sense can go. And instead there can be action that's just dispassionate. Right? Information is required, uncertainty, you know, how do we operate here? 
So it's a mistake to imagine that, <clears throat> in my opinion, that you know we either live in choices and awareness and everything is exactly what it is and so what, things are as they are and you're making a problem out of everything or anything, that's your fault. And we should just live completely accepting everything. Uh, that's an extreme. And the other extreme, of course, is we're going to fix and sort everything out. Both of these arise from an inability to deal or relate to the experience of difference and separation and distinction. You know, where people are different, things are different, things don't quite happen, things are this way. And uh, correct, once we begin to dissolve the frustrations or the projections or the disappointments or the cravings or the longings, there's a possibility to act with dispassion, you know, which is just, we open up a field of inquiry and interest into how things are arising. The inner pressure is dissolved. So, you know, the ceasing of the world, the ceasing of, of formations doesn't mean one is kind of oblivious but that these inner pressures, these pathologies can be cleared. And uh, so, you know, this is a, it's the, you know, why we come to meditation. We base ourselves in the present to clear that. And then when you pick up, you're coming into the experience of self and other and sensations and so forth, that and uh, future and past. But what's the fundamental intention? You know, the intentionality then isn't driven so much by avijja tanha, but what's called right intent. And right intent is generally understood, described as the intent based upon goodwill, the intent based upon compassion, the intent based upon renunciation. How to, how to let go, how to simplify, how to not get stuck into uh, possessions, possessiveness and competition. So then pure intent is possible rather than compulsive karma. We can operate with pure intent. And pure intent means Really, you recognize that all you have is the present. So, the arising in the present of what does not crave, does not push, does not demand, doesn't waver, this is the arising of, of pure intent. It means the, the sense of it's the engaging, connecting that decision to connect without a particular pressure or motivation and clearly the Buddha spent his life doing that and if you notice uh, you know when the Buddha from that position he could teach he could also admonish but it was always this action surely is not skillful rather than you idiot <laughs> or you'd say, you know, this is, cause, this is going to cause you a lot of pain and suffering. This would not be for your welfare, nor for the welfare of others. Just describing where that train is going, you know, rather than, you know, condemning a person. Because that's the, un that's the vision, that's the understanding of it. So the sense of others and self is concerned with intention. So that's a particular experience that happens dependent upon 
intention. You know, so whenever the experience of oneself arises, what's the intention, what's the quality, the intent there? Whenever the experience of someone else arises, what's the quality of the intent there? Mm-hmm. When there's right intent, then those experiences can arise and dissolve. They don't, they don't stick. We're living in this particular f- channel of the present, Behind us streams an imponderable well or spring of causes and conditions that have brought us here. Someone who thinks they live independently is someone who has no sense of appreciation for the causes and conditions that have brought them here. Someone who lives independently has no awareness of the causes and conditions they will generate in the future. Someone who lives dependently is always regretting the past and wanting the future. When we understand dependence and independence as both wrong views or partial views, we begin to understand codependence. And this gives us the freedom to act purely and to let action cease. This is why as a teaching of the Buddha, uh, it's a teaching that we can come back to, it's placed, it's there, we can reflect upon it, we can pick it up, we can look into it, we can test it against our experience. This is why it's taught. Because we easily forget it, is why it has to be taught. So I offer this for your reflection this evening.